and I'm John Seacrest, and I run the Seattle Angel Conference, um, as well as the S Seattle Startups Open Coffee every week. I help with Lean Startup Seattle. We run uh, uh, Startup Weekends, the next one, which will be on uh, April 1st. Um, and we do a fund manager peer learning group to try to drive more momentum into the ecosystem. And if anybody knows anyone in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, we're trying to put a uh, angel conference over there right now. So um, Bob, um, lovely to have you here. Bob has the distinction of being the one and only MC for all of the Seattle Angel Conferences that we've had. So now we're on round 21 and he will be the MC for Seattle Angel Conference 21. Um, but he also has his own gig as a part of uh, Startup Haven and the start, Startup uh, Poker 2.0 and the Founders uh, Dinners, as well as this um, Groundwork Accelerator and now the Groundwork Fund. So Bob, please take it away. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, happy to be here. Um, so I, as I was listening to everybody uh, talk about what, what they're up to from the founder side, um, I have come to the conclusion that there's no way I'm going to make any of you completely happy and satisfied because there's such a breadth of uh, models here. Uh, and I want to encourage you guys uh, to use this as some, hopefully provide you guys with some insights about valuation, how to think about them, it, it, especially in terms of scale. It's too big, too small, what's just right? Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to start with some high level thoughts about valuation, kind of get our, our, our brains churning on what valuation, uh, is and how to think about it. Barely scratching the surface, tons more to go learn. If you're fundraising right now, I highly recommend you take a couple hours and go Google valuations for your particular sector and for your particular business model because they all have elements, uh, uh, you know, uh, multiples and strategies and investor uh, needs and the way venture capital works in those, those sectors uh, and business models. So this, I'm gonna take more of a software bent on this one, uh, but the principles are all the same. Uh, so I'm gonna start, let me just bring up my little deck here. We'll go through this, uh, share. All right, uh, hopefully you guys can all see that. Uh, thumbs up, okay, good. All right, um, so first I'm gonna dispel a myth uh, that somehow investors want you to have the smallest possible valuation, and they just don't. It's not in their interest for you to have a too small valuation either. Of course, they don't want you to have a too big valuation, and you should not wanna have a too big valuation either. Everybody's trying to find the right fit. So there's you know, some of the reasons that they don't want you to have that too low uh, uh, valuations. First of all, they want you to scale. They want you to grow. They want you to uh, uh, go as far and as fast as you can with their capital to reach the greatest possible milestone you can. And if you have insufficient capital, you won't be able to do that. And your capital is always going, you, the amount that you can raise is always going to be constrained by the valuation that you have. Because there's, there's a range in which it just does not make sense to raise capital, again, either too high or too low uh, based on some particular valuation. And we're gonna obviously get into that more. Um, it's also important to know that VCs, especially angel investors, less so. It, 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 lots of angel investors, everybody has their check size. There's a range. I write 25K to 100K checks, or I write 250K to 500K checks. You know, VCs write bigger checks, right? And there are lots and lots of companies that they like that they can't write a big enough check into for it to make sense for them. Because if they've got a $200 million fund, they can't write a million dollar check. A million dollar check, that's, imagine having 200 companies in a portfolio and, and having to manage board seats and updates and, and all these things. So uh, often uh, VCs will actually have an interest in you having a larger valuation so that they can write a bigger check so that they can deploy enough capital to get you into their thesis, right? Um, so keep that in mind too. Now, they do care about you in, in a number of ways. And one of those ways is they want you to be super motivated. They want you to be hungry to go get success. If they dilute you too much, they know that over time, your enthusiasm is gonna wane because now you're sort of looking at a, like you know, a 
you know, an outcome that might be equivalent to getting a really good tech job, right, over 10 years, uh, uh, because you don't own enough of the company anymore. So you're going to you're going to be uh, uh, less likely to go the extra mile uh, and maybe get distracted. Uh, and that's bad for everybody. Uh, and and they're also they also know that their next customer, their customer, if I'm a VC, I'm going to invest in you. Who's my customer? It's not you, right? My customer is your next investor. I want you to get me a markup. I want you to get to a milestone. I want you to raise another round of funding at a higher valuation than what I gave you. Because if you don't do that, I lose too. That's a, it's, a, it's super bad for the company and it's bad for my, my image as, a, as an investor that I invest in companies that are having down rounds. But it's also just important for, for the venture capital market generally to have markups. They want to invest early and they want you to increasingly improve your, uh, your valuation, uh, which is usually tied to you know, good metrics and reaching milestones. And if you don't have sufficient capital to do that, you're less likely to do that. And you're then less likely to raise at a better valuation later. Because remember, it, it, it takes often 10 or 12 or more years to get to a liquidation event. And they might have invested in year one or year two. They're going to sit around for a decade and wait for that return. They want to make sure that you're in a position to get to that last round, not just the next round. All right. So just don't worry about that. Investors are not as against you as you might think. Um, and then I wanted to say a minute about uh, you as a venture scale founder building a venture scale company. There is a track that you're going to get on if you decide to take venture capital money, you have to realize that your new purpose is not to solve some great problem. It's not to make the world a better place. Those might be why you did this in the first place. But if you take venture capital money, your new purpose is to get to a liquidity event, right? No investor wants to invest in you if all you're going to do is do what you love forever uh, uh, and not have in mind that there's a liquidation coming at some point. Now, some companies go on a really, really long time. They become big brands and global companies and, and they never get acquired. Uh, good on any of you who achieve that. That's extraordinarily rare. And, and having that mindset now, I don't think you get really uh, bonus points for imagining what your company is going to be like in 15 years. Uh, nobody thinks your headlights go out more than about six months. Um, so be careful about thinking that, uh, you know, you don't have to ever worry about an exit and you shouldn't worry about an exit, but you should have in mind, like I'm taking money because these investors want me to return a multiple on that money. And that only happens when I get to some kind of liquidity event. Um, there is no, like, you know, it's super rare. And if you tell an investor what you want to do is raise one round of capital and then you're done, you're never going to raise again. Like, you know, the, the kinds of companies that fit into the category of raise one and done is pretty rare, especially in the, in the venture scale world where everyone's aim is to build something big and glorious, right? So you're gonna need successive rounds of capital. And every time you raise new capital, you should expect to increase your valuation two to five X for each round that you raise. That's a rough range, right? Um, but if you're not increasing your valuation by at least two X, then that's not considered a success. You might still take a little bump up and you'll be able to raise some capital, but nobody's going, oh my God, did you see that? They got 1.5X. No one's excited about that. Um, if you get over 5X, like be careful you're not in the, in the danger zone on too big a valuation. But if you, if you earn a 2X to 5X valuation, you're kind of on track. And if you're not, you're not on track and things are not gonna go well for you. And remember too, you know, we talk about, you know, investors want 10X returns. Uh, you'll see in a minute, I'm going to walk you through a, just a little bit of the math. That's not so outlandish because if you, if you imagine what a 3x return looks like, nobody's happy. You're not happy either. If you get a 3x return on invested capital, like you, you're not going to have a very good outcome. You're not going to have FU money, as they say, right? You're not like, oh, look what I did. I was a successful entrepreneur. Yeah, anybody who gets out alive with an exit, congratulations. That's really great. But I suspect that none of you are in this to make like 2x what you would have made if you worked for Google instead, right? We're, we're trying to build something bigger than ourselves. Uh, and if you, if you don't get to 6 or 7x, then the outcomes are probably not what you're thinking of.
So 10X is where investors uh, consider uh, a successful exit. And that's 10X of the invested capital. So raise a hundred million, exit at a billion. Um, and remember that it could take a long time, more than a decade usually, uh, to get to those really big uh, uh, exits. So how many rounds should it take to get there? So I just wanna set the stage for how to think about that venture track, that uh, treadmill as we sometimes call it. So you, you know, you'll do a small round, a pre-seed round, you'll maybe get some in, uh, angel investors, maybe a, a couple of small funds and, uh, and you, you raise a pre-seed at 500K, 3 million pre, we'll say. Uh, and then your next round might be 2 million at 8 million pre. And then you'll do a series A. And at series A uh, is typically where first exit starts to happen. You raise enough count, you built something, but it doesn't look like this can be a, a, a unicorn in the end. Uh, but there's an opportunity to kind of, as I would all refer to it, is get off the elevator at Series A. And so if you figure what an exit range would be, if you'd raise 5 million, and before that you raise 2, and then you raise a half million before that, so that's 7.5 million of invested capital, your exit range is going to be somewhere between 60 million and 90 million for people to be, or, uh, in order for people to be happy and think that was a great outcome. So imagine you, you raise 5 million and now you have to find someone who's going to acquire you for 60 plus million dollars. That's a great outcome if you can do it, right? But think for your own business, for your own uh, industry, marketplace, the model that you're, you're following for your, your business model, what do the comps look like for companies that exit for 60 to $90 million? And if you can't, and I'll use this phrase uh, multiple times today. If you can't tell a cogent story about how that's possible and likely for your company in your market, then you should spend some deep thought thinking about what you're doing and where you think you want to go. And, and if you're thinking, oh, no, I'll, I'll raise $5 million and then I'll sell for $20 million at a 4x multiple, we're going to do the math on that in a minute. That's not going to be what you think it's going to be. It's not, you're not going to lose money. They're, not, you know, they're going to come take your house away, uh, but it's probably not what you thought you were going to do before you put in all that blood, sweat, and tears. And so we just go up you know, series A, B, C. Um, I really encourage you not to think, you don't even think about series C. Don't even think about series B. Think about like what you're going to do in the next 18 months. But if you just fast forward where you think you want to go, and you should have in mind, I want to build a company like this that would have this scale if you can't uh, come up with a number that we, I want to build a company that's worth X and you know that it could be worth X because you know how big the market is, you know what customers will pay, you know what your margins are, you know what other comps have done in that space. You'd have some idea, am I building a $60 million company or am I building a $620 million company or am I building a unicorn? I, I think I can go all the way to a billion dollar plus valuation. Not every company can do every one of those levels. You should know where you're headed so that you can think about how much venture capital you're likely to have to raise because that's going to impact the dilution that you take. Um, so using this example of 77.5 million, um, uh, we're going to now go kind of talk a little bit about the numbers and what does that actually mean for you as a founder? So there's really standard ways that... Uh, investors invest, they want a certain percentage, you know, 20% is the common, you might have to give up 25, depending on your situation, you might give up as little as 15. In the early days, you know, if you're super hot deal, maybe you give up, you know, 10 or 15, but mostly you're going to be right around 20%. Uh, and over successive rounds of capital, you're going to get as founders diluted more and more and more and more. So this is what it would look like if you did a seed, a series A through D, through just the Typical evolution uh, of, 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 of a funding round. Uh, after you take out the, the stock option pool and, and where investors end up, as you can see, investors end up way ahead of the founders, right? But they, they allowed you to build a pie that was bigger than you could possibly have built without them. So you're getting a smaller slice of a very big pie. So now think about where you're going to get off that 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 treadmill or what 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 uh, floor of the elevator you're going to get off on and and now let's talk about that 3x i said 10x you know somewhere 
eight to 12 is really great. So what's wrong with a three X? Well, if you do the math on a three X uh, invested capital exit at the series A, and you can do the same math for all the different levels. Um, the, the capital raised at that point, let's just assume that it was 10 million, a three X would be 30 million uh, on, a, on a 10 million raised. So the investors will own about 45% at that time, uh, but they're also gonna have often, not always, but often they'll have liquidation preferences, uh, typically uh, referred to as participation, uh, if you ever see that term, and they're going to they're going to get some some additional bonus uh, uh, liquidation when 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 that happens, and so let's just let's say it's thirteen and a half million is what they earn in their equity, and then you know jumbling all the different preferences together, they end up taking four and a half million more out, which means they get eighteen million. That's a one point x ROI. That is a bad deal for them. That's not what they signed up for. That's not what their investors. Uh, invested in them to go do. Now, remember, VCs, are they also raise money, just like you. They go out and they try to get investors to give them money so that they can go invest it. And they tell investors, look, we're going to get like 3x puts you in the top quartile of funds. So you have to be able to tell all your LPs, your limited partners, those, those folks who are going to invest in your fund, that I'm going to go out and find really great entrepreneurs working on really great problems. And we're going to return, if you, you know, 3x minimum. They get to four or five X, that's great. Now they're up into the uh, uh, you know, top decile. Five or six gets you in the top decile of all uh, funds. You just returned 1.8. They're not happy about that, right? They don't, and at this point, they're not, you know, as they see that coming, they're not really very excited. They've got a portfolio of 20 to 50 to 100 if they've got several funds. They're gonna, they're gonna divide up their time and their help among the companies that they think can pay back the most to the funds. And if you're looking at being maybe a 1.8x return, how much of their resources are they going to spend on you? Not very much. Um, meanwhile, the founders managed to keep 35%. Uh, so there's 10.5 million. That's, that's a good payday, except it's split between two or three or four or five uh, co-founders, however many you have. Let's just assume three. So it's three and a half million each. Let's say it took you only six years to get to a series A and then finally exit a couple of years later. Uh, that's six years at 580K a year. Like if I could get a 580K a year job, I think I'd be pretty happy about that. Uh, but there was a lot of risk, a lot of blood, sweat and tears that went into that. A lot of sacrifice went into that. Uh, and so you're basically getting two, two and a half X, a good salary, a decent salary, not even a good salary, but a decent salary at Google. Right. And lots and lots of founders are really smart people. They can go out. If they weren't doing the, the, the thing they're doing, they could get a good job. Maybe not 250K. But if you think about the opportunity cost of spending six years doing something that doesn't make you more hireable when you're done, if you don't end up with sort of done money, you're, you're trading that opportunity cost for that blood, sweat, and tears that you put in over all those years, which if somebody told you today, Here's what you're going to do. You're going to have a really, really hard life for six years. And you, you actually might get nothing. But what you're probably going to get is probably twice as good as a Google salary that you would have got. I don't know if that's what you all have in mind, but I don't know very many entrepreneurs who start out thinking, yeah, I could go to work for Google, but I'd rather get twice that and go do this startup thing, right? We don't think about the salary or the, 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 we don't think about the opportunity costs in that way. We're driven. We want to solve a problem. We want to build a thing that's bigger than us. We want to change the world. And so when you, when you have that perspective, it's great. You, you bring that enthusiasm to your startup and your, your opportunity for success goes up. However, understand what happens if you don't hit numbers. Uh, the, the implications are, are, are big. All right, so let's go on. And you can see, I'm just trying to give you guys some ways, some framework, uh, some framing, to the ways to think about valuation and dilution and what the implications are for you as you raise money. All right, so uh, the topic of our conversation today is high valuations, like not just high, but too high. And that's the thing you got to worry about, too high. High is not, not bad. If, if your investors agree that, yeah, that's a, that's a high valuation, but we see that it's, it's a good valuation. Everybody's happy with it. And most importantly, the investors 
interests are aligned with your interests at that valuation, then that's fine. Uh, and it, as a founder, it, you know, it feels great because you're going to take less dilution. So that's why you want a higher valuation. You're also going to get more capital. You, you know, if you're smart, you know that raising capital is super important and having enough capital to do the things that you think you want to do is super important. Uh, and of course, you know, raising at a high valuation, you get some attention, which really helps with recruiting. Ironically, one of the things uh, that is a byproduct of having a high, high valuation is now uh, talent. Uh, thinks that your stock options and your chance for success are greater than some of the other opportunities that they see. Uh, okay, that's the good part. And really, that's a, that, those are the most important good parts of a high valuation. Uh, you, you, have the, you may have the expectation that, yeah, but if I can, if I can uh, have this high valuation, I can get this money, like all, all the other implications of, I have enough money to do all the things that I want to do. Those are all subsidiary benefits of raising at a high valuation uh, uh, because you will have the opportunity to have more capital to do the things you want to do. Now let's talk about what can go wrong. So uh, if you raise at a high valuation, and I, I've, I've mentored and advised just by way of background, more than 200 founders uh, 200 companies, founders from more than 200 companies over the last 20 plus years. And I've seen this many, all these things I've seen many times, Th these patterns that I'm sharing with you, I'm not making these up. Uh, these are real. Uh, the, the expectations that come, if you raise at a really high valuation, you better be ready for them because those investors are going to put incredible pressure on you now to perform. And if you don't meet these really, really high expectations, and don't do it really, really well, you're gonna have no excuses. You had, all the, you had all the money. We gave you that big high valuation. You're supposed to use that money to go hire a rock star team and execute the heck out of this. Why didn't you do that? So now you're under all this pressure for all these years and it has non-trivial mental health consequences. Um, the last handful of years, maybe five or six years, there's been more and more awareness of the mental health challenges of being a founder. Uh, and I'm here to tell you they're super, super serious. So take that part to heart when you think, oh, I got this really great valuation. It feels good for a while. And if you execute the heck out of it and nothing goes wrong, good, good on you. You're going to live a good life. That's, that's the, um, uh, that's the uh, adverse. Uh, no, what's the word? Um, doesn't usually go that way. <laughs> More often goes the other way. Um, and if you're a CEO, especially CTOs, less so COOs, less so, but the CEO is on the spot. Your, your head is on the chopping block. If you don't perform to those very high expectations, higher than if you would have raised at a lower valuation, lower valuation, get it. You're going to have a little bit less money. You're, you know, you're going to get there when you can get there. You're, you're operating in an environment of, uh, of limited resources. But if you raise a high valuation, zero excuses. And now the CEO is going to be held accountable for all those things that happen after that really high valuation. Your burn rate, um, you, you will not be able to control. You may think, oh, no, but I'm really frugal. I'm going to be super disciplined about this. No, you're not. There's going to be so much uh, um, pressure to do all these other things. Oh, well, we got this big marketing budget. Let's go do it. And you're going to spend money like a drunken sailor and you're not even going to know it. And then you're going to wake up with a tattoo on your forehead that says, I wasted a crap ton of money on marketing. You're going to, you know, get that nice real estate because you want your team to be happy. You're going to have a really bigger, bigger team than you should have. You're going to end up hiring fast and firing slow, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. You want to hire slow and fire fast, but you got all this money. Why wouldn't you like invest in these senior people, right? Because now they're going to help you grow faster. Uh, and if it doesn't go exactly as you planned, you're going to be in trouble. So the signals that this sends to investors, when you have spent all this money without showing the commensurate results, wow, you, you kind of blow through money. You're one of those CEOs. Right now you're now you're really on the chopping block. Wow, you know we we thought you know you weren't performing quite up to your numbers, um, but you know we'll cut you some slack. Startups are hard. 
But if in addition, you did all these other things and just blew money, now the CEO is in trouble, all because they raised so much money at such a high valuation that they set themselves up to be in this situation. So um, startups are hard, they take a long time. Uh, and if you have a lot of money, then you are, you're gonna get lazy. I guess is the easiest way to say it. Um, you're now not worried about making payroll. Payroll set for 18 to 24 months. Like you can pay everybody, you can hire a big team. Uh, so now you can start to do some things, you know, chase some of those other distractions. Like, you know, we thought we were gonna do this, but why don't we do these other experiments? We'll do this other thing. We'll do this other thing. We'll do this other thing. And then a big partner comes along and says, oh, we'll wanna do a big thing with you. And you spend 10 months just totally distracted from your core business because you had the money to do it. Cause you could hire a team to go do that thing. Um, and, you know, a lot of us uh, fledgling founders uh, who, who maybe don't come from a, a corporate background where you, you know, managed a big P&L and had, you know, 50 direct reports or something. If, when a team grows, that's actually hard. In the early days, it's super, super hard. Because when you're hiring a lot of people, you have to be able to manage those people. And you're going to be hiring new people to the company who are not in the company yet. You're, it's a whole lot of unknowns. So you're going to have people you don't know managing people you don't know. That's an inevitability eventually, but if you do that right out of the gate, it's hard for you to control culture in the company because uh, almost everybody in the company, only the founders are left to accept culture. Meanwhile, you, you hired 30 people and they all have different backgrounds and you, there's no way a couple people, a couple founders can get, uh, get a team uh, uh, focused and, and humming around a North Star and a culture, like that's really, really hard. Don't underestimate how hard it is to grow a team super, super fast when you're a couple people. All right, so um, when we raise a lot of money, we're very excited because um, now we get to go do all those things that we know we can do. Um, and there are some things that you probably are capable of doing and you, you know how to do them. Uh, and you've got the resources to do them, so you're going to go do them. And if you go do all those things, then you should be all right. But a lot of the things that you're going to have to do are going to be out of your control. Um, and you know, if there's an axiom, uh, if there's a pantheon of axioms for startups, everything takes longer and costs more than you think is near the top of the list. Uh, no successful startup I know has ever said, oh, yeah, you know, actually, things went really quick. And it was cheaper than I thought. And gosh, that was a breeze. Uh, everything is going to be bigger and take longer and cost more than you think. So you're going to, you're going to use up that money faster than you think. Uh, the market is going to change on you. And depending on what aspects of the market changes, uh, it can totally devastate your assumptions. There was a startup, I won't mention any names, um, some years ago here in Seattle, uh, uh, rock star, celebrity CEO, everything's going to be great. Like all the numbers were crunched and it felt like overnight. Uh, it was just a couple, over a couple of months, their user acquisition channel uh, completely morphed. It was in mobile and it, it just did a judo flip on the cost of acquisition because it was at a time where, uh, you know, people were just starting to discover like, wow, here's a way we can go acquire all these mobile customers. And so they were willing to pay a ton to go get those mobile customers. And their assumptions broke and they had to shut the company down and give the investors back their money because the, the, the model no longer worked. Now that could happen to any company. As it turns out, this particular company raised a, a very good amount of money at an extraordinary, the highest valuation I'd ever seen uh, for that amount of money. Uh, and it would have been terrific if their market hadn't changed, if the acquisition costs for them hadn't changed in that way, because they had no other answer. And uh, it was devastating the company. And again, remember, great product, great team, great market. Like they had, they were firing all cylinders. And then over just a couple of months, a trend in the market uh, killed their business. Uh, and of course, you know, right now you're going out and you're innovative and nobody else does it like you. Uh, but, you know, if you're in a, a highly competitive market, you should remember that big piles of money don't lay around unattended very long. 
and other uh, uh, of your competitors are going to get smart and new competitors are, are going to come in the market um, and you will get surprised. And now all of a sudden you've got this super high valuation and all these other companies around you now are competing with you, making it harder for you. And they're all raising money at valuations that are now going to be compared to your valuation. Um, so those kind of, they're, you know, losing a key customer course is, is, can be devastating for an early company. Uh, so these are all things that, you know, as just examples, oh, there's so many more, just some examples of the kinds of things that can go wrong, where if you had a, 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 a reasonable valuation, uh, you might still survive, but at a super high valuation, now all of a sudden, nobody sees how you're going to pull out of this and you become, um, a bad deal. Uh, there's also um, a tendency for founders to think, well, I, I, I need some money, but if I just raise a bunch of money, then I can go three years without raising. I can just skip around. I don't have, you know, you know typical fundraising uh, cadence, you know, roughly 12 to 24 months, call it 18 months nominally. But if you raise enough money, then you won't have to raise for a really, really, really long time, effectively skipping around. Um, but as I said before in the previous slide, you know, it's so hard to, to not overspend. If you have the money and you see the opportunity, it's super, super hard to have the discipline and the financial savvy to know like, oh, that, you know, you, you're going to have to manage uh, your spend in, in a way that someone who's got less money won't have to because they're, they're in a constrained mode 24-7. They're always pinching pennies. They're always spending every dollar like it's their last. Right? They're, they're trying, they're eking it out. They're battling to get to that next milestone. You don't have to do that. And if you don't have to do that, why would you do that? And so while it might sound great to extend your runway a really, really long time, it usually doesn't go that way. Uh, and you know, when you are talking to your investors and your, your traction is slipping and you, know, you are in board meetings and you're really feeling the pressure like it's super hard to not try to just spend money to improve your metrics. Uh, and that might work in, a, in the short term for the next board meeting, but long term, probably not going to work. So these are the ways that we tell ourselves that it's okay to raise all this money, but there are, there are elements that are working against you. Uh, they're going to make that super, super hard. All right. So for, for fundraising now, figuring out, uh, you know, the, the way in which a high valuation uh, uh, affects you and your, and your business. So certainly if you have a higher than reasonable valuation, you're gonna endure a lot of friction in your fundraising, which means it's gonna take longer. You, there are certain investors who wanna invest in you. You can't underestimate or you can't, you can't overestimate, you shouldn't underestimate, and you can't overestimate the amount of effort it takes for a CEO to raise a round of money. Uh, and typically, I mean, I tell a founder, if you're going to, you know, actively raise capital, you should expect to spend 70 or 80 plus percent of your time doing nothing but raising money. And that is going to detract as a small team in an early company, having the CEO doing, you know, 70 or 80% or more of their effort is going towards things that's not growing the business. You spend six, eight, 10, 12 months doing that, the business is going to suffer. And as you do that, if you're not ready to raise at that valuation, there's going to be a stink that's going to get on your fish. Why? Oh, really? If you were really that good, you'd have done it by now. You keep telling me that this thing's going to be a great company and all these great things are going to happen, but I've been talking to you for six months, eight months, 10 months. I don't see it happening. Part of the reason why it's not happening is because you're spending all your time on fundraising and you're pursuing a valuation that investors don't think is reasonable. And remember, they're not against you. They're not all, we're not, they're not all bottom feeding, right? Some, some do try to find distressed deals, but mostly they want you just to have the right valuation. They know that their, their success comes from outliers. They know that the companies that really, really do well are, are where they're going to get most of their returns anyway. So they're not worried that you're going to go out of business. They're worried that, uh, you know, that you can do it at all. And if you spend a ton of time beating your head up against a wall, trying to raise an valuation that's not getting any traction, uh, then it doesn't show well on you. Now, we're in a period right now, we've been in for 
you know, the, this last almost a year or so where valuations have just been crazy high anyway. So I talk about like in normal situations, like, you know, if you're beating your head against the wall, trying to raise a certain valuation nowadays, what you have to worry about is you can raise that high valuation. You got to be careful whether or not you want to take that valuation. Uh, but just know that, you know, we're in a, we're in a period of time right now where, where valuation exuberance is really, really high. Uh, it won't last forever. Uh, and one of the, one of the most, I should have actually uh, uh, added this to the presentation. You have to remember that I, yeah, I'm, it might be coming up. I'll say it now though. Your next investor will not have the same thesis as your current investor. That next investor is a year and a half, two years out, three years out, four years out, five years out, wherever that valuation starts to catch up to you. The fact that that early investor took a bet on a big valuation because they have a thesis that says, I'm going to invest in 50 companies and uh, uh, a few of them are going to go to the moon and the others I don't care about. That next round of funding, they don't invest in 50, they might invest in 20. And then the next one only invests in eight, right? So they, at each level up, they invest bigger checks in a smaller amount of number of companies. They expect uh, uh, a different risk profile, a different return profile. But just because you can find someone who right now will give you an exorbitant valuation doesn't mean you're going to be able to find that same kind of investor at that next level, because it probably won't be the same investor. It's going to be a different kind of investor at that next level. Um, and that's where you can get in yourself and just to a, a ton of trouble. All right, so um, let's see. I guess this is kind of what I was talking about, but let me go in a little bit more detail. Um, so as I said, big valuation, big expectations, that's super hard for you. Uh, oh, here, yeah, <laughs> next slide. Uh, so future investors will not have that same thesis. So um, when, you, when you take that valuation, you should know what number your next investor is gonna expect out of you. So if you think, you're raising right now for 18 months runway. You're going to start raising again in a year because you don't want to run out of money. And you think you're going to get to, you know, 2 million ARR. And that would be great if you got there. So if you get to 2 million ARR, what kind of investors will give you what kind of valuation for your kind of company in your sector uh, uh, with 2 million ARR? That number is important for you to know. Uh, because the thesis of those investors should match that. If, if, if you raised at, you know, 20 million pre uh, or 30 million pre, 2 million ARR is probably not going to cut it. So if you think you're going to raise all this money and then you're going to go get 2 million ARR, and then that's somehow going to allow you to uh, raise, you know, 20 million or 10 million or whatever it is, you just need to run the math on that because those investors you know, they, it's a range and you can know the range. You can talk to people, you can talk to investors and find out what do they like to see? And if you've set yourself up to not be able to reach anything that looks like what they like to see, unless you execute everything perfectly, man, you could be in a lot of trouble. If you have set yourself that way and you kind of miss your, your numbers by a little bit, like you did pretty good, uh, you may still be able to raise a flat round. It's, flat rounds are terrible. Flat rounds are, are better than down rounds, but they're not great. Um, that basically extends your runway. You're going to get some investor who, who and it's often an inside investor who's already invested in you. Like, well, I'll, I'll increase my commitment at the same valuation. Uh, but new money coming in to a company that didn't meet its numbers that's, that's a red flag. You don't want that on your resume. If you miss them by a meaningful amount, you're headed for a down round. Now, you know, some companies do recover from down rounds. Lots and lots of companies don't recover from down rounds. So know that that's not just like the stock market. Oh, stocks go up and stocks go down. Like the price of Bitcoin today and the price of Bitcoin tomorrow. It's not like that. You, if you have a down round, it's like, oh, it's a down round now, but next time it'll be an up round. It doesn't, doesn't work that way in venture capital. So when you think about the, the impacts of a down round, know that you're going to get highly diluted. If you're worried about dilution now, like, oh, I want to get a big valuation so I don't get so diluted right now, you're going to get, you're going to, you're going to be in a bad way. I was going to use some foul language, but <laughs> it's terrible. 
you're now going to have to give investors some of your shares to make up for the fact that your valuation went down. And that's, imagine that. You're going to take, you know, your investor go, oh, you're having a down round. So you're going to go try to raise a million dollars now. You raised before at 10, but now you're going to raise at seven. That's a 30% decline. I'm now going to take some more shares to maintain my position because I have anti-dilution provisions in my, my shareholder uh, agreement with you. Because remember, you're at common. All the founders are at common. All the VCs are going to come in at preferred shares. And they're going to have special rights. And those rights will vary from, from, um, from deal to deal. But just know that the common shareholders, which at that point is largely the founders, are going to absorb virtually all of the dilution that happens, right? So down round, you're going to, you're going to wish it didn't happen for sure. Uh, and for some founders, depending on how bad that dilution is, it could be existential, like game over. You know, can you really justify continuing to work on this company when you have just been crammed down on your ownership such that you're going to lose some control? You're now under a lot of pressure from your board um, and your outcome is now uh, materially reduced because now you, you just took a big haircut on your valuation. Down rounds, terrible. In addition, now your investors are on red alert. Uh, and the CEO, for a company that's had a down round, lots and lots of CEOs don't survive the down round. They, CEO's gone now. You screwed the pooch. You couldn't do it. We think this is still a good company, good opportunity, good product. The team is pretty solid. The CEO is now fired and they bring in a new CEO. Uh, and everything gets harder. You know, if you do have to raise a down round, like the kind of diligence and questions you have to answer when, when you pitch to him about, hey, here's what we're doing, here's our team, here's where we're going, the market, the product, da, da, da. Like, oh, that's really exciting. What about this? What about this? Can we see your finance and blah, blah, blah. Now you had a down round. That now you're, you're answering really, really, really hard questions that you didn't have to even address before. <clears throat> now, if you've ever known a founder who went through a down round, um, <laughs> It's horrible. They're, they're sad. Um, they're sad and depressed. It's super, super bad. Uh, they try to, you know, keep a stiff upper lip, uh, but it's super, super hard. And not just because they just got diluted and they're under all this pressure, but now they have to go lay off some team and, you know, the team that remains, their options are now not likely uh, to be as valuable or even, you know, come to fruition. Um, people are trying to figure out what went wrong and depending on the dynamics inside the team, who screwed this up, whose fault is, yeah, the product guy, no, the marketing guy, no, 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 what, you know, depending on the dynamics of your, of your, of your teams, uh, and people are going to leave and that's terrible for the morale of a company and startups are on thin ice. Anyway, if you've got a toxic culture, then you're in even more trouble all because that round was a down round. Um, so again, it's not just about your dilution and how much you own at the end of the day, which remember, if you go all the way with a big fat venture scale company, the founder is going to own around 20%, right? Maybe less, lots of, and in fact, there's a, some great, uh, numbers out there that show what the founders owned at that final exit. Uh, one study of IPO companies like the Etsy founders had 0% when they IPO. Uh, and there's a handful of, you know, big companies that IPO and the founders were just, they're written out of it. They got nothing. Uh, and, you know, a lot of us, we travel under the radar. We don't have big, fat, sexy companies that everybody's following on, you know, tech crunch and things like that. But know that if you're a B2B company, especially, and you're selling in an enterprise, their own diligence about whether or not they should work with a startup, um, often comes down to whether or not they think you'll be there in two years. Should they really spend all this time, effort, money training their, their, their employees to use your product and putting their name behind it with their own customers only for you to go out of business? So, you know, if you have a down round, that makes selling into enterprise customers especially hard. Um, and if you get any publicity around that, it, it's just really, really bad PR. Um, so. 
uh, when you're thinking about valuation, please do not think that you should get whatever valuation you can get. It's not what the market will bear. Uh, and it's not what I told you or some other single advisor told you. Uh, it should be what the market's telling you, what, in, what you're hearing from investors. If a bunch of investors are all saying the same thing, you really should listen. Um, be careful about hyping stuff up. A lot of us are really great storytellers. We're good persuaders. You know, we, you know, we might be more likely to get an extra 20, 30, 40, 50% on our valuation just because we're, you know, gift to gab and all. Um, but be careful that you're not talking an investor into something that even you shouldn't want. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of, um, you know, I talked to founders like, oh yeah, but all these companies are getting all this money and these valuations. So this company's like our company and they just raised 50 million bucks at, you know, 300 million pre or whatever. And um, you, you, first of all, you're not a trend. You're a single company with a single amount of traction and a single team. And uh, your product is your product and your sales are your sales. So the trends overall will either help you or hurt you. If valuations are really high, you, you have the chance to get, uh, get a valuation at the high end of the range of good valuation as opposed to the low end of a good valuation. Um, but don't make the mistake of thinking, you know, we're going to raise at 20 million pre for our, our seed round because these other companies, just like us in the same space, they just raised at 50 million pre or they raised it, whatever. It doesn't matter. You don't know the backstory. You don't know that the investor knows the CEO and invested in before and he made him a lot of money. So he trusts them. Uh, you know, you don't know what the, the confidential parts of the business model where they've got this big strategic partner lined up and all I have to do is six months to launch this thing. And then they're going to have this, you know, $10 million client. You don't know any of that stuff. Don't worry about what other people are raising. The way that you should work on your valuation is based on what you need, the capital that you need to reach your next relevant milestone, plus about six months. And you should probably plus that by 30% because we all suck at estimation and assumptions and modeling. That's kind of where your valuation should start. Then, or, or the basis for it. And then multiply by four or five or maybe six. If, you're, if it's six or more, if it's, certainly if it's more than six X, what you think you need to get to your next right strategic milestone, you're, you're highly likely to have a valuation that's gonna misalign you dramatically with the incentives of your investors. And it's going to create all this risk for you for all the reasons I've been talking about for the last 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so as a starting point, this requires a spreadsheet. You got to do the math on this. You got to figure out where do we need to go next? And, you know, when I hear founders say they're going to raise a million dollars, I'm like, oh, why a million dollars? Well, because it's our seed round or it's our pre-seed or whatever. Well, that, that's, that's the amount you should raise, right? I don't know, maybe, but maybe not. If your answer is just because that's what a round like this should be, then it's it's automatically wrong. And the question is just whether or not you're gonna you know, uh, uh, get in trouble for it. So get out a spreadsheet, figure out what you need, the people you need to hire, the things you need to build in order to get to that, that place where you would hit an inflection, a strategic inflection that would allow you to raise the next round of funding. If it's 250K, it's 250K. If it's 500, it's 500. If it's 2 million, it's 2 million. If it's 10 million, it's 10 million. <clears throat> but you should be able to tell a cogent story about why this is the next right place for that company to be in, you know, six to 12 months. You know, if you're raising early, uh, one of the biggest mistakes, it, it, I shouldn't say biggest. I don't want to use any hyperbole here. It's a big mistake though. Don't raise too much too early. If you're raising for, if you just started the company, you got a little bit of friends and family, you've been around for about six months, you got some prototypes or whatever, and now you're going to go raise 2 million bucks. Uh, that's rarely the right thing to do. It can be, I'm not saying it can never be the right thing to do. Um, but if you don't have a cogent story for why raising $2 million when you're pre-product, unless you're now, now again, different sectors, right? If you're a medical device, healthcare, you know, biotech, your first round might be 10 million, right? And you're 17 to 27 years away from your liquidation event, right? Whatever the numbers are for your industry, you have to translate these things that I'm saying. 
Uh, but for most, for software, platform, marketplace, these kinds of things, uh, you know, you, your very first round should get you to a place where you can prove to that next level of investor that you're a great deal and you're onto something. Uh, the very earliest money, friends and family, angel money, they're happy to come along for the ride and yeah, let's have you go prove it. Like go do some experiments. You don't have a product, but I believe you can launch something. Let's go figure it out together. Uh, once you get past that where valuation matters, those early investors, they're going to be investing under notes or safes that might have a cap, um, but it's a small amount of money. Uh, the real, the most important round you're going to raise is that first seed or series A where it's a priced round. If you did a series seed or, or a, 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 a series A where, uh, uh, where it was a priced round, that's the one that matters the most. Um, so, so make sure that you get that right. If you raise more than you need to get to the next right strategic milestone, then you, you leave yourself open to all these problems that, that we've talked about and you, you leave money on the table, right? Your valuation, if you reach a strategic milestone, one of the things that happens is your valuation goes up a lot. It's an inflection point. You've got to a strategic milestone, not like, not that next thing that if you work for six months, you get there, but that thing that if you get there, all the investors that you're talking to would agree that, oh yeah, that's the right next place. If you get there, that's the right place to be. You should try to get there. Can you get there? Do you have the capital to get there? Because if you can get there, then I see that your valuation just went up. But if you raise too much too early, you miss that value, that valuation inflection point. And now you, you end up coming out of it in the middle of some other inflection point, And you end up in what's called wait and see mode where investors are like, oh, this sounds really great. Let's, I'm going to watch you and see if you get to a next inflection point, or at least you get close to it. Because at that point, you find yourself just talking about what you're going to do how great things are gonna be, instead of look what we just did and how great this is, right? So timing on fundraising has a lot to do uh, in your valuation, will be highly dependent on what strategic milestone you're about to hit or have just hit. And remember, if you have a strategic milestone that you're about to hit, if your story is, oh yeah, if we just had money, we could hit it, man, that's a bad place to be. Investors don't wanna hear you say, if we had money, then we could be great. <clears throat> they want you to say, here's what we did with what we had, and it's great, isn't it? Now, give us some more money, and we're going to go get the next great thing. All right, that's all I got. Um, so, uh, John, uh, is this Q&A time? Or... Yeah, cool. Thank you so very much. Yeah, I think it is Q&A time. I just asked in the chat if people had questions. I've been dumping content into the chat. Mm -hmm. um, you got... Uh, uh, page that has all your contact information so people can find you on your slide deck uh no i don't hmm. all right um well then uh, but uh, i could do that yeah well why, why don't you work on that while we uh see what people think um you want to stop sharing your uh screen for a second sure cool thanks everyone so um everybody seems to come at this I have this really cool idea. I need money to build the thing and therefore give me money. Um, and then I'll build this cool thing and customers will show up. Right. And that's, that's a very frustrating story for investors. And so we want to emphasize that look at what I did. I'm doing pretty good with what I did. If you give me some money, I can take these thousand people over here and satisfy their need faster and I'll get to be a bigger company faster, right? So we're talking about investing in growth, not investing in building in a lot of ways. And so there's a conflict in that conversation for a lot of people. So this concept of a risk-reducing milestone seems to be very difficult for um, us to get you know, tight on for people. But if you're not selling and then you begin selling, you're now in a fundamentally different place. If your cost of customer acquisition moves from being wildly unpredictable to predictable, you have now reduced your um, risk substantially. And I would argue that before you've bounded your cost of customer acquisition, you essentially are a startup that doesn't know who your customer is and you don't know what your product is. And once you get to a bounded cost of customer acquisition, preferably one where the cost of acquisition is a 
a small piece of your margin, not a, uh, the complete margin, then you now have a real live business and you know who your customer is and you know what your product is. And now what you have to do is sell effectively and deliver the service effectively rather than hunt around to try and figure it out. So this is me um, sort of framing the conversation. Did anything come up in Bob's conversation that you want to ask a question about? I see a question from Larry in there. Yeah. Yeah, I see the question too. Um, IP does matter. Uh, you know, and and uh, it it's different for different companies. Like if you have IP in, in, in biotech, super valuable, right? If you have IP in... Uh, an app for you know tracking recipes, uh, probably not very valuable, right? Uh, so IP can be very very valuable, and you need to have an IT, IP attorney who understands your space who can help you value that. How, how do founders and VCs typically define and measure? place to reach monthly active users, revenue, what are the key metrics, I think is what on, uh, own is looking for. Yeah, it's really different based on the product the sector and the stage. Um, you know, the, I, I think you should as a founder, when you're thinking about what that uh, right next place to reach is, it should be quantitative. That's the number one rule, it should be quantitative. If you say, oh, our, our next strategic milestone is to release this new feature, if it has anything to do with your product, then it's probably wrong. Nobody cares about your product. I'm sorry, almost no one will care about your product. Products are easy, uh, sales is hard. So you wanna drive metrics that show that you're building a company that can sell something to other people and other companies. That's what makes a company successful. You have the best product in the world if you can't sell it. And this happens all the time. I know John, you've seen this over and over. Wow, what a great product. That's a great market. Why aren't you selling it? Oh, it's not ready yet. It's got to be better. It's got to do all the No, you solve a problem for someone right now. You need to go sell it to them. The product will get better over time. You'll expand your customer base. But right now you have something that solves a problem for somebody. You should go sell it to them. But everybody wants to wait until it's perfect. And, you know, it's got to be grand. It's got to be the big market. It's got to be a big go-to market. It's got to, everything's got to be big. No, you should, if you're not selling the moment you have something that solves a customer's problem, then you are waiting too long yep. to your detriment too. This is, this is, this is startup killer stuff. This is, I just, I just, I'm going to write a blog. I, just, I, I drafted it last night. I met with two companies, kind of similar, you know, software, blah, blah, blah. Um, one of them, and they're very similar stages. <clears throat> one of the, they both struggled because they weren't doing, sale. They had a great product, but they weren't selling it. One of them, uh, you know, took some advice and just said, you know what, we're just going to double down. Everything we do is sales. We're just going to go out and sell what we've built a great product. It's useful to some people. We're just going to go sell it. The other one said, well, you know, we have to have the iOS version first. We only have the Android version and it needs to have this dashboard that allows people to do this payment thing. And da, 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 da. I'm like, wait, but you just described an Android product that saw it, it's a, a, a B2C, so it's not like it's like a big platform play. B2C, it solves a problem. Why aren't you selling that right now? Oh, it's got to have this. We're almost there. I just need to raise some money so we can finish the development of this thing. That company is going to die. I hate to say it. They've been at it 18 months. They spent a few hundred grand. They will not survive because there's no one on the team that has the recognition that it's important to actually sell the thing too. Just like John said, they, they're in the mode of, yeah, but it's going to be great. And so naturally, when we finally release it, everybody's going to flock to it. And I'm telling you right now that almost never, ever happens. So do yourself a favor, whatever traction in your product, uh, whatever uh, in your sector, um, whatever traction looks like, focus on that. Don't focus on product. Like some, there are some, like if you're, if you're, if you're doing a new uh, knee replacement uh, device, there's no like, well, this one, you know, you can kind of hop a little bit, but you can't really run, right? That's not a thing. You got to, that's why, you know, uh, healthcare, biotech, uh, pharma, those are all really hard things to do. They take a really long time. If you're doing anything that has to do with software, you should figure out what's the first bite of the elephant. 
you don't have to raise the entire elephant or eat the whole elephant all at once. Where's the very first problem you solve for the very first customers who would be willing to pay for that value? Go find them and start selling it. The numbers don't have to be big. That's what I think a lot of you know, founders, they, they lose track of what's important for investors. What's important for investors is that things start moving up into the right and they keep moving up into the right. The numbers don't have to be big in the beginning. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, if you made a hundred bucks one month and then doubled that to 200 and then got to 600 and then got to a thousand over four months, thousand bucks, nobody cares about that. But when an investor looks at those four months, goes, oh, you started selling and it's growing. How, what'd you, what'd you learn from that? What do you, you know, you look like a company that wants to sell things and keep things going up to the right and you keep it going up and to the right every single month, do everything that you can to make sure that when you talk to investors, what you're showing them, even though it's early and it's small, it's up and to the right over and over and over again. That's a really, really great place to be. But what founders think is, oh yeah, but it's only a thousand bucks a month. Nobody cares about that. So I, I'm not going to do anything until I think I can get $20,000 a month. Then I'm going to go start selling. Well, that's great. But now you're in wait and see mode. Because now you tell me you're going to go do that. And now I want to go see you do that. Right? And if you set yourself up to have this high bar of traction, whatever that traction number is, and you weren't consistently just month over month over month over month building it, now I, now I have to wait for month over month over month over month to see if you can actually do it. So... Get started. It doesn't matter if the numbers are small. Just get them started. And then you have something kind of like there's this, there's this picnic, company picnic, uh, my wife's company picnic I went to a few years ago. And that's a really fun game. Like they, everybody gets uh, two balloons and you hit them in the air and then you have to keep both balloons in the air all at the same time as long as you can. The last one with two balloons in the air wins. And it's just really interesting uh, feeling like, oh, I got to keep that balloon. Oh, that one's coming. I got to get that one up. And you're just, you're trying to keep the balloons up in the air every single second. Um, and sales, early sales is kind of like that too. If you don't get started, you don't have anything to keep in the air. But as soon as you get that, you're like, oh, I got to keep that balloon up. I got to keep that balloon up. I got to keep that balloon up. Gives you something to focus on and it makes a story, right? It, you, if, you're, if your metrics are jagged, flat, down, up, down, flat, there's no trend there. I can learn nothing as an investor about your likelihood of being able to go up and to the right. If, you, if I don't think you can go up and to the right, I might still invest for other reasons, but you, you don't have that traction on your side. You don't have, you, you're not sending that signal that you could have sent that said, we're not just about ideas and uh, uh, building stuff. We actually care about selling too. And so what we've tried to do is develop a discipline that it's product's not enough. We know we've got a great product. We know our customers are going to love it. But we know that if we start selling early, we're going to learn more than we could possibly ever learn if we waited, because we're going to get our product in people's hands and we're going to learn from that. And we're going to build things that we wouldn't have otherwise built because now we're trying to you know, satisfy the customer's real problems. And, and investors love to hear that. But almost no matter what, I mean, if, you know, John and, and, and everybody here gave you advice on and, and, and introductions to investors you should talk to, you should still figure out what you can get into customers' hands as soon as possible. As a pilot, as an early customer, as a simplified, super simplified product, you know, don't wait, don't wait too long. If you've already built something that you say is an MVP that is rough around the edges, then you, you've built something, you know, uh, a non-trivial and you should get that somewhere or another, a piece of that, you know, and remember the, the aphorism is if you're not embarrassed by your first product, you waited too long to launch it. So don't make that mistake. Bob, as always, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm glad to have you here helping us with these kinds of conversations. My um, pleasure. Do you wanna... I hope it was helpful. Um, and uh, please delete, when you put the recording out there, please delete everything that I said. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. We'll uh, see you next time. Uh, I'm sure Elizabeth would love to see you at the APIS Health Angels on March 24th uh, if you want to see what the uh, health outcome, uh, which company we invest in. <laughs>